you survived another week. Thank you for listening, downloading, and supporting the Black Man with the Gun Show. On this week's episode, number 531, how to make money in the firearms business, and how the fundamentals of marksmanship also apply to life. Michael J. Woodland says, before you modify your firearm, dot, dot, dot. Did you hear about the little girl who put the band-aids in the refrigerator? When they asked her why, she says it was for the cold cuts. This is a weekly podcast for the mature and the cool people in the gun community. The show's title is to inspire, not to incite. My name is Ken Blanchard. I'm a gun rights activist, an author, a trainer, and a professional speaker, showcasing the diversity of the gun culture with experts in hunting, gun rights, the justice system, American history, and self-defense. And it's done all with compassion for all people. Welcome to the show. I'm reminded of an important lesson that I want to share. Life is like a camera. Focus on what's important. Capture the good times. Develop from the negatives. And if things don't work out, take another shot. Shooting is often used as uh, an alliteration or imagery to help us remember stuff. I forgot that and was just reminded to it about it today. Sometimes when you're shooting, especially if you're competing, You're really only competing against yourself. I don't care if there's a line of people shooting with you. You're shooting for yourself. The clay burrs that you break, the targets that you punch holes into, the steel that you ring, the whatever that you're hitting, it's only you and the gun. Life is like that too. It doesn't matter if the person next to you doesn't want you to win because they probably don't. It doesn't matter that the person that you think is in your corner really isn't because it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you have haters. It doesn't matter that you have people that you can't trust. It's not a nice thing, but it really doesn't matter. What matters is that you take your time. And just like shooting, you need to remember the fundamentals of good shooting. Stance. You have to have a platform. You have to stand for something. You can't be willy-nilly. You can't just be going with the crowd. You have to stand for something. You got to get a grip. The world's nuts. Don't count on them to keep you steady. You got to be able to control the recoil, the trouble, the stuff that happens in our lives. You got to have good side alignment. You got to have a goal. And it has to be a realistic goal, a goal that you can make. You got to have a good sight picture. You got to be able to see through the fuzzy part, through the part that you hadn't, you shouldn't be focusing on. You got to go around the noise so that when you pull the trigger, you are in control. Self-control. It's a bigger word than you think. It means that you're not going with the flow, that you're not listening to the naysayers, that you're not following the haters, that you're not getting caught up. Just like at the range when you can Ignore the shot. Ignore the noises left and right of you. Ignore opposition. And breathe. Don't forget to breathe. Sometimes we can hold our breath. We can get so caught up that we forget to relax, to inhale, to exhale, to do the simple thing of breathing. And what happens when you pull on your trigger and you've been having oxygen deprivation for a few minutes, your whole gun shakes, your whole body shakes, your situation is shaky. Don't forget to breathe. And then there's a rinse and repeat kind of thing. Well, you got to follow through. The fundamentals of life are pretty much like the fundamentals of shooting. I'm hoping that you're thinking about that right now. No matter what you're going through this week or had gone through, try again. Don't give up. You can do better, you can make it, you can even win. This portion of the show is sponsored by CrossbreedHolsters.com. 
Crossbreed Holsters has gained national recognition as a maker of the best and most functional concealment holsters available on the market today. Each holster is handcrafted to ensure your firearm is safe and secure while carrying, combined with the best customer service in the industry. Visit CrossbreedHolsters.com. Training tip from Mike is next. Thank you, Ken, and welcome to another Tips and Review segment. I am Michael Woodland of M-WTactical.com, and today we're going to discuss before you modify your firearm. A few months ago, while having a conversation with a family member in regards to lowering the pressure it will take on the trigger, opened my eyes to a mistake a lot of people make about modifications. Some people do think that if you do such modifications, it will make you shoot better. In my opinion, I disagree. My reply to my family member was a simple response. You should learn the art of shooting while learning yourself before you make any adjustments to your firearm. Like my grandmother used to tell me when I was younger, why are you putting salt on your food and you haven't even tasted it yet? How do you know what your performance value will be with the firearm without the necessary time it takes to place to be established? When I first got into practicing all the time in competitions, it took two years before I did a serious upgrade on my firearm in which I still shoot today. After all the shooting and making corrections, it seemed I hit a wall. The modifications did help a bit, but not so much to throw me over the top to an excellent shooter. Understanding what you are capable of doing with the firearm is majority of the fight. The modified firearm will do what it is intended to do. Like anything else, do some research, learn your lane, and make a sound decision. It may be that you feel more comfortable with a stock firearm versus one that is modified. You never know until you test the waters. Until next week, Keep the trigger pull level and your sight picture steady. If you haven't done so, get on the M-W Tactical Facebook page and hit the like button and share your firearms thoughts with us. If you would like to stay in touch with the information we put out on Twitter, follow us on M underscore W Tactical. If you want to see the pictures of our adventures on and off the range, follow us on Instagram at Munitions Weapons Tactical. If you would like to read more about us and see what and where we will be next, visit www.m-wtactical.com and stay informed. If you want to ask questions or send us a note, you can either by calling 803-250-1256, leave a message and we will return your call or just email us at info at m dash w tactical.com until next week keep shooting keep practicing and have fun back to you ken this week i want to get personal i want to tell you some stuff that will help you not make the same mistakes that i did one of the biggest things i want to tell you is how to make money in the firearms world that sounds good right how to make money in the firearms business first you got to realize that this thing is a business maybe not this thing I was just called a tool by a lady the other day that I sought some counsel for. She says, podcasting is not a business. It's a tool. And if you don't know what you're doing with it, then you're a tool. I thought, damn. Then there was the other guy who I sought counsel from that was into sales and a really good and successful business person. And he basically shot me down, too, and told me all the things that I've been doing for the last 30 years have been a mistake. If I had any ego left, it'd be gone. But I'm going to give you the simple reasons. I can tell you 99 things that don't work in this business, and I'm hoping that you will listen and heed my advice. Because it's really easy, actually. To make money in this business, in the firearms industry, you only have to do a few things. The first is to find a solution to people's problems. And that can be through services, products, and information. That's it. But in those three is the conundrum is the issue, is the challenge. Finding solutions to people's problems. You can make money in services as a gunsmith, as a trainer, making courses. You can create products, guns, holsters, ammo, you know, stuff. Leather goods, safety equipment, targets. Information, 
You can make money doing that. Training again. Books, articles, videos. The challenge and the difficulty comes here. The firearms industry is also embroiled, embroidered, connected to, married to politics, to competition, and to a culture. And for those who are listening, let me let you know also that gun rights activism is not a business. Well, it's not a business for you as a grassroots person. It's a business for those who do it, the organizations behind it that get us to come to their events to um, buy their stuff, membership organizations. That's their business. But you most undoubtedly lose money if you travel on your own dime, if you speak at these different events, if you take off from work, if you protest, if you go to rallies, if you do all the stuff that you do to keep the right to keep and bear arms for all people you will most likely lose money. You will become the most famous broke person in America next to me. You'll get the name recognition. Everybody will know who you are. It won't personally get you to the American dream of being self-sufficient, about being an entrepreneur. Those two things are two different things. It's real easy, though, to confuse them. I know I did. You can make a note of all those who are successful and have been on television, who have had their own videos, who have their own services, products, or information that are in this industry that you don't see them with the activism. Not as much. They'll be there, but they're not doing it like you're doing it. And there's a reason for it. It doesn't make any money. Now, money isn't everything. But if your goal is to be independent, is to be an entrepreneur, is to make money with something that you love, that's not the way you want to go. What will happen, though, is... Before you realize all this, you'll be angry. You'll be frustrated. You might even say a few things that will get you abused by this culture, by the politics, and by the competition. And it's just normal, actually, because you'll find out that you've been used to some point, and you didn't know it. I am learning in my old age that sometimes following your path means getting lost, being stuck, going backwards, forging ahead, blazing your own trail, and eventually you'll make your way home. I don't know who I'm talking to and who is connecting with what I'm saying, but growth is painful. Change is painful. Nothing is as painful as being stuck somewhere you don't belong. I'm just trying to help somebody. So since you're my friend, I'm going to tell you some inside stuff. I'm just going to keep on sharing some personal struggles and stuff that I had to go through. And maybe you don't do the same thing. And maybe you haven't heard this part before. Probably not because stuff that hurts, you don't really tell all the time. But I want to make sure that you know so that you do better than I did. See, when I started this in 1991, um, I wanted to start my own business. I wanted to be a firearms instructor that was serving the country, that was serving my neighborhood, my community. I didn't know about that gun activism part. I didn't know about there's a business for people to get to entrepreneurs, to take the money that you have. They know your optimism. They know that you are a hard charger, that you want to make a change, and they're ready to take your money. It's a lot easier now. We have social media. It didn't exist when I started. It was AOL 1.0 when I began online. When I had my first website, blackmailthegun.com, we were using barred modems. Yeah. Yellow screens, monochromatic monitors. Remember that? That's when I've been. That's when I got started. Before Facebook, before Google, before YouTube, I was there. But being first kind of makes me more like a mountain man than a business person today. I had the coon skin hat on. I had the the flintlock rifle, not the AR that you carry right now. That came later. And then I had to adjust and change. I was still out there. Folks knew who I was, but I wasn't really moving the needle in the direction that I wanted to go. So I had all that stuff happen before. I had it where I was there. I've seen it. I know people as they are. When I was in law enforcement the first time, I had a chance to visit with a guy by the name of Bernie McCain on WOL 1450 AM radio here in Washington, D.C. And Bernie was a hoot. He was a mentor of mine. He was a wise old con man. He was a great dude. I mean, he was just smooth. He had access to a whole bunch of stuff. He knew some some history, and he taught me. But I was doing it out of fear at the same time. My employer did not want me to be anywhere near the media. They were leery of the media, just like they are now. Even worse back then. Be afraid that I would tell some secrets because I was actually working for the Central Intelligence Agency. 
So everything that I did, I had to okay with my employer. That's really how the name Black Man with a Gun got started. It was my alias. Folks would go, whoo Black Man with a Gun, and that would take them off of them trying to figure out, where did I get my knowledge? What was my base, my bona fides? They got that in quiet conversation. I didn't have to do it on the radio or on television. But I was still terrified that I would lose my job before I got straight. Talking on the radio, asking and being around people who were considered pretty controversial at the time. So I'm trying to operate a business out of secret. Yeah, pretty much that's how it worked. And that kind of stuck with me where I didn't pursue the camera. I didn't pursue radio and television as much as people do today. I didn't chase that many influencers. I was afraid when it did happen because I actually worked with Virginia, with Texas, with South Carolina, with Michigan, with Wisconsin to get concealed carry passed. I actually testified in those places. And I was terrified. At the same time I was testifying in front of CNN cameras that when I got home, there'd be an FBI inquiry that I had also talked to media about something else. So I had to be really, really careful of my words and what I did. That hardly ever left me being afraid even after I got out of the agency. Then there's the culture of our community. You know how there's those who are high speed, low drag. Well, I was there too. But I was there before Desert Storm and the Iraqi invasion and Afghanistan. When I was in Afghanistan, we were friends with Osama bin Laden. Yeah. Can't say that too many times. But there were people who will say, hey, he never did anything in, in the CIA. He, he don't know anything. I can't even debate you. I can't even like have a fight with you on the Internet. Let the trolls beware. Just do your thing. You can just say whatever you want. I know what I've done, and so do the people who I was with know. And that's as far as I can let it go. But all that doesn't change anything today. I know my backstory saved lives. I know I personally protected certain people in the government. I know I've traveled to over 15 hostile countries. Five that were at war at the time. Probably at the time you were in high school or junior high or working another job. Then I got off track because I'm trying to push the needle. I'm trying to see what I can do. And I got hung up into gun rights activism, even though it's a good thing. It's a great thing. It helps everybody out. There's no money there. So I had to try to figure out how to convince the spouse that what I was doing was for the good of people. Definitely wasn't helping our bank account because I helped us go bankrupt back in the early 90s, personally. Yeah, I've had some struggle. I learned about having too much overhead in your firearms business when I, my studio, I had to close down my training school. I remember when I tried to buy a range here in Maryland and found out all the different difficulties there with insurance and, again, the community. And then I had to fight my own demons, my own jealousy and hatred and anger and just stuff. When somebody who doesn't seem to have to struggle as hard gets ahead. It happens to us all. Right now, at the time of this recording in 2017, we live in the information age. You can get about anything you want to off of YouTube. Folks will just download an app, and if it's not free, they're a little wary about paying for it. We live in a culture where everything is a give me. Don't want to pay for anything, even if it's quality. That doesn't matter. So if you are in this business, you have to learn how to um, find solutions to people's problems that they're willing to pay for. That is another challenge. So you can write for free now. A lot of the major magazines are gone. Your blog gets more eyeballs than some other paper magazines do. And they hate you for it. I remember when I went to a SHOT Show and I was on the bus, one of the first times they had started and the bloggers and the podcasters were on this thing and I got abused not knowing it, that I was actually on the bus. 30 or 40 other uh, magazine editors and stuff were just crushing us in uh, vitriol talking about how there are these podcasters and bloggers even show up at shot show. I worked for nine years underneath so-and-so and and just to get a byline. And now here is this young cat writes on a blog and gets more eyeballs than I ever did. Or this podcaster, they're talking out of their basement in their mama's house somewhere and folks are buying their stuff or listening to their thing. The culture changed. Haters are going to be haters, though. Video became king. YouTube, if you have your access to a range where you can videotape, videotape your own stuff, oh, you rocking it now. Have access to an outdoor range? 
you have a one up on anybody on the inner city who has to use a static range and probably can't do anything because the range owners are so paranoid about losing their range because of unsafe habits or some funky thing that you might do. Trust is a big thing on the indoor ranges in the inner city. Again, it's a business. You can't build your business really successful on somebody else's platform. And that especially goes for things like Facebook today. But that's a different story. Different different slant there. And then I mention politics. Yeah. I didn't care if you were a Democrat or a Republican prior to my gun stuff. I didn't even I didn't even care. I just voted and moved on. I got snatched right up in that thing really heavy. And that was the issue. For years, the people that I started hanging out with were conservatives. I didn't know I was a conservative. Didn't even know it was such a bad word until recently now. It's like, ah, you're one of them. I bet Trump sends you Christmas cards, doesn't he? No, but I did get them from Charlton Heston, and I thought that was cool. Because he was a Democrat and a really cool old guy. But that's another story. Who was Charlton Heston? Yeah, I might have to look that up, right? But I ain't bitter. I'm trying to get better. Competition. Quite a few firearms instructors now. A lot of veterans. A lot of uh, gear queers. A lot of uh, folks who are former something, and they got a channel. And the only way that you can step above some people is you want to step on their necks. You want to dog them. There's a whole bunch of folks. Seemingly all come out of the same state, actually, that are real negative. I'll let you figure that one out. See if I'm right. Then we got our culture. A lot of us are A personalities. Alphas. It's rough having alphas in one room. If there's no enemy to fight, we fight each other. So it's good when we got, you know, the Bloombergs and the Soros and all those guys to attack. Because when they don't say anything, man, it's on like popcorn. We fight each other. What this instructor is not doing, what this training company is not doing, what this personality is not doing, you know. We got professional trolls on our side. And like the Ascari proverb says, when two elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. So when you got the big personalities who dog each other, you got a whole bunch of people who are trying to figure out which way to go. Who should I listen to? Who can I trust? Now, if you can't say amen, say ouch. But I know I'm talking to somebody out here. You feel me, right? So what happened to me? What did I do in this mess? Well, I couldn't really push the needle any further. I got on a podcasting thing in 2007 and been rolling with that ever since. Going on my 10th year come this November. And I found a spot where I could actually talk to a few people. Make a few people smile. Make a few people think. Not a lot of money in that, but I was fortunate enough to be sponsored by a few companies over my tenure. And I got about a handful of people who are taking care of me as patrons of this show. That's more than I could ask for. That's a blessing like nobody's business. Sometimes you're the only one that's keeping me going, believe it or not. The one or two emails I get from you, even when it's to say, yo, man, I don't agree with nothing you just said. This, then I'm not talking to myself down here in the basement underneath the washer and the dryer of the Blanchard household. Because the wife, man, the wife gives me some, some grief like nobody's business too. She's like, how long you been doing this stuff? I know. When are we going to get rich? I know. When can I retire? I know. All the people you know and nothing's happened? I know. But podcasting has been more than just me spouting off stuff, though. I have connected with a few people that had had some stuff in their life, and they, and they loved, liked, and trust me enough to tell me. So out, outline, I got, I got a chance to be the pastor of Patriots, Pistoleros, and Paladins. The handful of people who have considered suicide and then called me has made a difference in my life. They allowed me to minister to them, to even though my church did not like the fact that I had foreign people coming to the church to see the black man with a gun. They did not like that. Didn't like the fact that me and Jesse Jackson didn't get along. The fact that me and Al Sharpton didn't get along. My church didn't like that too high. So the first chance they got, they got me out of there. No problem. I'm a pastor without a church. Unless you count 
the ministry that I do online. The friends like you, who I've actually had a chance to to wed, officiate at weddings, to do baby baptisms, to house blessings, and to just care about you offline. And then my sales coach, which I had to fire him because, again, he's hurt my feelings too much. I guess I am not as um, tough-skinned as I want to be because sometimes the truth hurts. He says, you're running this thing like a ministry, not a business. Yeah. Because see, when I started, I said what I wanted to do. I wanted this to be my business, not a hobby, but a business. Didn't have a range. Afraid of video. Afraid of getting locked up by the FBI for letting out secrets, even though I didn't do it. I was watched, and I had to be careful of who I allowed to be around me. I had to say no to some stuff to protect other people. They don't even know what I was protecting them from. I was the real-life spook that sat behind the door, and they were afraid that if I would have just let go, I could wreak havoc. But I love my country. I love my life. I love my family. I protect those who I can protect. Remember, if you want to make money, all you got to do is find solutions to other people's problems. And mixed in here is our culture of black and white America, of the struggles of institutionalized slavery and today, of people who, well, you know. There's no way to talk that thing around, no way to fix it. You have to let people learn on their own speed. They don't realize that where you where they are now, you've been. They look at me now and they don't see the scars. They don't see the times when I scared people. They don't see the the learning. The struggle is real. Remember being chastised by Aaron Zellman. I called him my Jewish mentor. I was counseled by Larry Pratt of the Gun Owners of America for not being confrontational enough from both of them, actually. But I do believe also to thine own self be true. I had to learn to stop explaining myself when I realized people only understand from the level of their perception. Stuck in a generation where loyalty is just a tattoo, love is just a quote, and lying is the new alternative facts. The guy I'm still learning from in podcasting, Dave Jackson, says, for those who have money, there's therapy, and for the rest of us, there's podcasting. When you can tell your story and doesn't make you cry, you know you're getting healing. And that's where I'm at now. So just because you're my friend, I'm just going to share this stuff with you. That's why I've been telling you. And hopefully you got something out of it, something, a nugget, a piece of it. It's kind of like eating fish. You eat the meat and you leave the bones there. Eat the best part. Pass and share on what works. But I gave you the secret. It's up to you to take it from here. I finally realized that I'm no longer stuck. I am moving on. And in that movement is this thing I called the Fun Gun Club. It's a social club. And you've heard me talk about it already. Last couple of shows. I'm Ken Blanchard, and I want to invite all those in the Maryland, D.C., and Virginia area that aren't a part of a fun gun club to join mine. It's called the Fun Gun Club. Yeah, that's what it means. It's real. It's going to be something where you can have monthly training. Don't have your HQL yet? Don't know what that is? You'll find out here. Can get concealed carry? Able to get it? We'll work on that one here, too. Got a gun? Never shot that bad boy. We'll bring it out the mothballs. Training. Fun. There's a lot of things that you can do outside of a static gun range. Did you know that the F in firearms can be for fun? Yeah, we're going to do it here. Be a part of a new thing that I'm starting, and it's going to be a blast. The Fun Gun Club. If you're interested, email me at blackmanwithagun at gmail.com. It's for the Maryland, D.C., and Virginia people Right now.
It's not for everyone, though. If you qualify, contact me, blackmanwiththegun at gmail.com. The Fun Gun Club. And that was the commercial that uh, played for you last week, in case you missed episode 530. Since then, we've had a meet. We've had uh, a conference call. We've had... See, I got all this stuff. I'm using social media now that I didn't have back in 1999. I'm going to use this stuff, man, like nobody's business. T-shirts are being printed, and they are on the way for those who are uh, first adopters, those who believe in your brother and jumped on it that are around this area. And I actually thought about cutting it down to uh, $99 for the next six months. So if you want to do a trial membership for the first six months of the year, we can do that. Just contact me and we'll take the information from there. Why does it cost? Because I've tried the free method and it doesn't work. It doesn't. Folks don't commit to it. Um, folks waste time. I'm not saying you will. But if you want something to be good, you got to invest in it. You only get in it what you put into it. I've learned that too. And money actually chases some people away. In this day of free, yeah, it's a bad word sometimes. Especially when you're trying to do something. Thefungunclub.com. Check it out. This is just um, some brief information. The real information comes from yours truly. So if you're interested, contact me at blackmanwiththegun at gmail.com. This portion of the show is brought to you by the United States Concealed Carry Association. The USCCA has been providing education, training, and self-defense insurance to responsibly armed Americans since 2003. Join Tim Schmidt and myself here at usconcealedcarry.com. All right, that's it for this week. Next week, I want to let you know that I'm going to be talking a lot about a new company. Well, not a new company, but it's a new company to me called LWRC International, formerly known as Land Warfare Resources Corporation out of Cambridge, Maryland. I got a chance to spend a day with them, and uh, it impressed the mess out of me. I'm really glad that I did that. I want to thank all of you who listen, download, and support this podcast through Patreon.com through however you do. Thank you for your words of encouragement. Thank you for your emails. Thank you for being a part of the Black Man with a Gun app where you can get all this stuff absolutely free on Google Play and on iOS systems. Thank you, Michael J. Woodland, for being my friend and brother. Remember that mistakes are proof that you're trying. Do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. This is your friend and brother from another mother, the Reverend Ken Blanchard. And just in case nobody has told you this today, I love you. And it's not a damn thing you can do about it, homie. Until next week. Shalom, baby. One, two, three, four. also the black man with a gun.